introduction. Uh, I hope you can hear me. So uh, I would like to thank uh, all of you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak for the, to you in the next 45 to 50 minutes. And let me please start by uh, sharing uh, my uh, screen with the presentation so uh, we can uh, go, go over it. It will be a minute. And hopefully Zoom will not uh, betray us uh, this time. So I hope that uh, everyone can uh, see uh, the slides. And the topic uh, of my talk is really an, an overview. Uh, so uh, we will start by a very high level general overview on this whole fascinating world of standards and regulations. Then I will describe the approach of uh, measurable safety and coverage driven verification. CDV stands for coverage driven verification. And we'll end by a, a real pragmatic examples how you can verify a automated lane keeping system, which is a level three automated driving system and use CDV to verify it based on the regulatory spec. As I understand, uh, the session is not interactive and uh, I will address uh, Q&A at the end of the session. So let's uh, move on. And the first thing to do is really to try and figure out what's the difference between standards and regulation. A lot of time it's quite uh, confusing and uh, these terms are being used interchangeably. So regulation is actual legislation where legislation, you have to comply with it. This is being set by some regulatory or government authority. Standards, compliance to a standards is voluntary unless you are obliged to comply to it by some regulatory authority. And there are different uh, standards development organization and many standards, especially in the automotive industries, are being uh, developed. Uh, so the whole industry can work according to a specific uh, uh, spec. The regulatory authorities in many cases will refer to specific standards when they apply a regulation. The topmost uh, standards organization, which are also recognized by the United Nations, are ISO, the International Standard Organization, IEC, and ITU. ITU is more focused on uh, communication, IEC on uh, electrical systems uh, in general. So uh, if we look at them, these are complementary uh, systems. Standards are voluntary, as I said. They, a lot of time they are developed in consensus by some independent organization. Uh, as a process, they are revised. It's not something that is uh, set in stone and ISO is requiring a periodic uh, revisions. And uh, they usually provide specification, test method, and their goal is really to allow an industry to work. Uh, the legislation is imposed by law, by some government authorities. Uh, it revised whenever the, that authority or government decides that the revision is needed. And their main goal is really to protect public interest. In our case, it will be public safety. And in many other cases, it is safety. But that's the goal of the, the legislation. So regulations are intended to protect and, and, and keep the interest of the public. Standards will usually come from the industry side. Uh, how is a standard being developed? So uh, there will be a standard development body, a committee, these committees in many cases will include representatives and experts from different sources, whether it is the industry, the business, uh, or the academia. So this is a, an expert committee that is de developing a draft of a standard. That, that committee is driven by the standard development organization, which may be one of those that we mentioned. Sometimes a government will ask for a standard to be developed. Sometimes these are private organizations that are developing standards. And uh, a standard is developed in most of the cases by a consensus. That means that the committee has to agree 
uh, on this. In some cases, there is a voting process where majority will set uh, the outcome, but the ideal is really to get to a consensus of the content of the standards, which will include guidelines, technologies, uh, or others. Uh, if we look at the different standardization bodies, they you can find them at different levels. Uh, I mentioned earlier the international one, uh, the three recognized by the United Nations, the ISO, IEC, and ITU. ISO stands for International Standard Organization. I ITU is the telecommunication, as I mentioned. IEC, electrical, and it's also focused on software. Uh, you can also find regional standardization bodies. These will be usually in uh, federations or in countries. Like CEN is the European standardization body for the EU. You will find national standardization bodies that are for specific countries. Uh, examples are ANSI, the American Na National Standard Institute. So all of these are developing standards and a standard can be adopted. It's not necessarily that it has to climb through a hierarchy. I mean, in order for an ANSI standard to become uh, adopted and agreed upon, it doesn't have to go through ISO or anything like that, though you will find in many cases collaboration between those standard development uh, organizations. Uh, there are different methods to drive the development of standards. Uh, some of them are top down, some of them are bottom up. Uh, so uh, I think uh, what you can find out is uh, really in the world there is a partition and the US or the North American continent in many cases is uh, different in its approaches from uh, the rest of the world. It may have some historical uh, reasoning for why. But uh, in the, the US, uh, a lot of standards are being developed bottom up and we will see some examples in a few slides. That means that there is some initiative coming either from the standard development organization or from an industry, specific industry, and they drive development of standards. In other regions, the development of standards is driven top down, which means the, the standard development body is being approached by a government authority or a regulatory authority with a request to develop a specific standard and it will uh, start and create this standard uh, as a result of this request to satisfy the regulatory demand. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, some private uh, standard development organization. So uh, let's start and focus on the automotive market. And uh, we have few major players that are developing standards in the automotive uh, market. The most uh, prominent one is the SAE, the Society of uh, Automotive Engineers. Uh, its home base is the US, but they are working internationally, like uh, there is a Japanese branch of SAE and in other locations. And they develop uh, different standards, for example, the common terminology that we have today for level of autonomous vehicles, level one, zero to five, was developed as a standard by SAE. Uh, the standard is called J3016. Uh, IEEE, the Association of Electrical Engineering, uh, is also developing different standards that uh, include the automotive uh, industry. Uh, UL Underwriters Laboratories are a new entrant to this domain with UL 4600, which I will uh, mention later on. And ASAM is, the, is a European standard uh, uh, development uh, entities with a Japanese branch and recently also with a branch in China. Uh, and they are developing uh, standards for the last uh, 20 years for the automotive industry. Again, I will present some of them standards in uh, two, two, three slides. Now, from standards that, as I mentioned, are voluntarily, let's switch to regulation. So uh, vehicles are presenting an interesting problem for most of the world. For Japan, it's a slightly different because Japan is a set of islands. But if you think about the, the Europe, then vehicles are traveling from country to country. 
So there is a need to create some coordination on uh, regulation for vehicle and mutual recognition and acceptance by uh, different countries. And this is happening in the entity that is setting international vehicle regulations, the UNECE, and specifically a working party, working party 29, that is the World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations. Uh, this is a forum that uh, was established uh, initially in 58, and it has, as in, uh, it has delegates from different governments that are the voting parties uh, for the different regulations, and they are uh, synchronizing between national vehicle regulations and harmonizing them. Uh, they are working in cooperation with various uh, sectors and standard setting bodies. They are not doing it by themselves. So I mentioned earlier IEC, I, I, ISO, and ITU. And you can see here different contribution of standards to the UNECE regulations. Uh, I mentioned IEC on uh, electrical system, so lights and uh, the headlights of vehicles. ISO, for example, regulations on tire and tire installations, things that we don't think about that you need to, to harmonize between countries. So uh, the WP29 has established a specific subgroup to work on developing regulations for autonomous vehicles. Again, with the goal of harmonizing it between different countries. What you want to achieve is at the end of the day that a vehicle that was qualified and certified in one country will be accepted and allowed to drive on the road of a different country. And again, Europe is the classical example. If you certify a vehicle in Germany, you want it to be to drive to Italy with no specific additional testing or, or certification. So uh, GRVA is the subgroup that is working on setting uh, regulations for autonomous vehicles. And they have a set of topics that they need to address uh, covering the full domain, and some of these are being evolved, and I will uh, mention them uh, later on. Uh, a specific focus that I will cover at the last part of my presentation with the prior pragmatical example is really the fact that GRVA is developing a set of new assessment and test methods. When you think about it, 30 years ago, in order to certify a vehicle, you tested the brakes, you tested the smoke, and that's about it. Today, with those sophisticated system, you need a lot more to test, and you need to decide how to certify uh, a specific uh, new aut automated driving system. You have to address cybersecurity and others. And uh, all these are being addressed by GRVA, and for Fortelic specifically, uh, the set of new assessment and test method is of main interest, and we are proposing some of them to GRVA. Uh, of course, uh, the, the reason I put this here is just to mention that uh, Japan is a significant contributor and a significant participant both in uh, WP29 and also in, uh, in uh, GRVA and its regulation. And uh, as a result, Japan is also adapting the regulations that are being set by WP29 uh, and uh, GRVA. One of the more interesting regulations that were set by uh, GRVA, uh, sorry, by WP29, is regulation number 150, uh, 157. And the interesting thing about it is that this is the first ever regulation for automated driving system level three. The regulation were, was approved on uh, June 25th. And it's uh, getting into effect in January of uh, 2021 in all more than 60 countries, Japan among them, that are par part of the charter of the 1958 agreement of WP29. And that means that starting this date, a, ma a manufacturer can certify this level three system 
automated lane keeping system uh, based on the regulation and put a vehicle on the road. Uh, I will just give you a head up that automated lane keeping system is different than lane keeping assist, which we see today on many cars. And I will uh, focus on that later on when I will describe the actual verification of ALKS based on the regulation. Uh, I will uh, finish with just, uh, you know, giving you the tip of the iceberg of uh, some standards that are evolving in the different organizations. Just to show you that there is a lot of activities in standardization uh, of uh, autonomous vehicle. Uh, I saw there are several work groups that are working on safety. SOTIF is the safety of the intended functionality, a standard that we will, will be published uh, next year. There is a group of standards that are discussing how to do safety evaluation with scenarios and how to specify ODD. ODD is the operational design domain, a critical factor for specification of safety uh, of uh, uh, autonomous driving system. And ISO is basing its work on uh, the British Standard Inter Institute initial foundation for that. And there is work on scenario classification. I mentioned earlier UL 4600, which was adapted by the American uh, National Standard in Institute to become an ANSI standard. And this is a standard that articulates a process of how you do safety evaluation of autonomous products. Very large book that tells you what you need to test and how. Uh, SAE is working on another set of standards uh, on top of the recently published. It will include safety metrics, uh, definition of maneuvers, and how you should ha handle the uh, risk situations and others, all these will be published probably in the next year. And ASAM, the European Association of Standardization, is also working on a set of standards. Uh, ASAM is working on a set of standards at the actual engineering and implementation level. And if we will uh, just uh, take a look at these, then ASAM is solving or offering standards for the different tasks that are required for a workflow uh, to test an autonomous system, whether it is on a specific on a simulation based or whether it is on a test track or any other system. And if we look at this, it is a standard to specify test, ODD, open scenario, a standard to specify scenarios, drive, CRG, and many others. Uh, some of these are already working on their next revision, like ASAM Open Scenario uh, used to be Open Scenario 1.0, which was released uh, last year. And next year, ASAM will release Open Scenario 2.0. And this is where uh, for, te for Telix is uh, heavily involved in driving these standards forward with many contributions from uh, the for Telix uh, system and language. And with that, I hope uh, you got just a flavor of what is this world of standard and regulation. And this will lead us to the, how do you use this for safe assessment of uh, automated driving system or what we call in Fortelix measurable safety. So the key messages that I, I'm asking you to take out of this part of the presentation is that really automated vehicle or automated driving system safety needs to be quantifiable somehow. And it can be measured and quantified. And I will introduce coverage driven verification, which is a proven method to quantify maturity of complex hardware and software systems like automated uh, driving system. And I will uh, convince you hopefully that coverage metrics can and should be used to quantify the safety of uh, automated driving systems. So let's start with our status today. The whole world is struggling with the question whether an autonomous driving system is safe. We have practically four 
testing platforms uh, for this system. One is pure software simulation. The other are mixture of hardware and software that are called, uh, whether it is hardware in the loop or vehicle in the loop or uh, any hybrid system which involves uh, both uh, simulation and the, the actual hardware. You are doing some isolated testing on test tracks and you are actually test driving uh, the autonomous driving system on real, uh, real world uh, streets and roads. For all of these, the problem is that there is an infinite space of scenarios that can happen to you on the road. And you really, there are really no standards or rating system that tells you what you need to measure and test. So uh, regulators are also struggling with the question of what to demand for the certification, what can be tested. And the, the key question is really what is safe enough? You can always test uh, some more. Till now, the industry is using a very simple measure of the quantity of miles. And from time to time, you see a press release, uh, the, this company drove a billion miles uh, on real life driving, and this uh, drove 100,000 miles. So the companies are logging miles, and they are also measuring disengagements, which is the number of times that the test driver had to take the control from the automated driving system uh, and uh, operate the car by, by, it, by himself. Uh, I would uh, say bluntly that the reason you are measuring these numbers is because you can measure this number. You really cannot compare miles on road A to miles on road B or miles in a city to miles on a highway. So the accumul cumulative number of miles is really meaningless and you actually don't know what you tested and whether the system is really safe enough. Fortelix is claiming that the industry should transition from measuring quantity of miles to measuring the quality of coverage and performance, which is to really measure whether you have successfully exercised the critical scenarios that are required uh, for AV safety and extracting the metrics uh, to do. And what, more than that, we claim that the coverage metric should be the core of a safety case. A safety case or a safety argument is really a sort of a book that the OEM, the car manufacturers, is handing out to the regulatory authority articulating and arguing why the system is safe and describing everything that was measured, uh, measured in it, right? So uh, usually you have test suites and you have different processes that are being defined in different standards. And there are a set of common known methodologies that are being used. What Fortelix is proposing and in fact uh, demonstrating is that coverage metrics can support all of these and should be used as a measure to what was tested and how. So after uh, speaking uh, on all of these, let me explain the term coverage because uh, sometimes it's kind of uh, confusing. Uh, I will start by the, explaining the term measurement. If you test a vehicle and you measure something, then you, you measure a specific measurement. On a given test, you can specify a specific distance. Like, for example, what was the distance that was kept between the autonomous vehicle and the vehicle in front of it? But this really is a value for a specific test, and this will be a specific performance indicator. Coverage metrics are actually a, an aggregation of all these measurements, and they give you really a picture of out of all the possible combinations or all the possible value, how much did you cover? How much did you test? And uh, the way to think about it is some 
shape in the multidimensional space that really tells you from all these combinations how many, how many were tested. And this gives you indication of really whether the system can be trusted. Now, coverage-driven verification is not a new invention. Uh, this is the main method that is used today by the chip design industry uh, to verify very complex system. All of you have very complex microprocessors or GPUs in your laptops that are in front of you or in your cell phones. All these are verified using this method. The method uh, came out of a crisis. Early 90s, Intel, uh, the world's uh, largest microprocessor designer, uh, had a very serious bug in floating point numbers calculation in the Pentium processor. And this cost Intel half a billion dollars at that time. Uh, so Intel invested a lot of effort in developing this method. The main principles of the method is really that you are continuously plan what you want to coverage, you test, you analyze, you find coverage holes, and your goal is really to maximize the coverage out of the full space. And in order to do that, you use a lot of randomization techniques to create many tests. So for Telix is taking this method and taking it uh, uh, to this automotive industry. And for Telix is supplying the building blocks to create this data-driven measurable safety. What are the building blocks that you need in order to do that? So in order to de design the, space, the, the coverage space and the test, you need planning capabilities and a scenario description language capability which for Telix is developing. Then what you want to do with this, you want to have software or technology that is really capable of reading these as your goals and work with all the different testing platforms that are available and create and generate these tests on all these testing platforms based on their capability. And of course, at the end, you want to aggregate the metrics, aggregate the coverage results, and look at where you are. So these are the foundational building blocks that uh, are required to implement coverage-driven methodology and produce the coverage uh, metrics. The process itself is actually an iterative process. It takes place throughout the development of the automated driving system, and it can continue all uh, later on, even by collecting data from actual uh, real driving. But the main intent is to bring the automated driving system for certification. You start with an initial plan and initial set of scenarios. You generate many, many variations of these on all the four different uh, uh, testing methods you analyze where you are and you refine your plan and specification accordingly and your goal is really to increase the coverage and test and exercise the automated uh, driving system as much as possible of course the massive usage of it will be in simulation uh, there are physical limitation on the capacity of all the other systems simulation you can really exercise uh, a lot more uh, I don't know how many of you were exposed to other methods or approaches in uh, this world of autonomous vehicle, uh, so I will not dive too much into details. Pegasus was a research project uh, funded by the German governments to come out with the testing methods uh, for automated driving system. Their main approach was to analyze existing uh, statistical data from uh, driving, uh, from analyzing today's uh, driving data on German highway and from accident database. And from this, they derive different distribution functions for different parameters. Coverage driven verification is really a complementary method to that. It's not a counter method, but it complements Pegasus because in addition to the statistical data, it's also adding requirements that you may have not seen in the statistical data, and it's also adding the randomness uh, to that approach. A similar project exists in Japan. 
Sakura is a Japanese uh, research project. Uh, many agencies and Mittel are also uh, involved in it and uh, finding it. And uh, same way uh, with this, uh, coverage-driven verification is really complements some of the data-driven analysis to generate the scenario and, their, uh, and the driver model in adults. And it is adding coverage goals as yet another source for scenarios to be tested. So I think till now we have seen the basic building blocks that are required for coverage driven methodology. But remember, these are the, I would call them the technological building blocks. The scenario description language, the ability to generate simulation and test on many testing platforms, and to aggregate the um, uh, results. On top of that, in order to make it into a full system and allow wide deployment also by regulators, you need another layer, which is more of the usage layer on top of the technology. So you would like to have a set of scenarios libraries that will enable you to easily test an ADS for a specific usage and to have a, a set of standard templates test libraries and ODD, operational design domain definitions, which are the external spec for the operational, uh, for the operation of the ADS. Given these two, what you can do is you can really have a standard protocol for testing and verification of ADS. And with these, of course, you will be able to derive metrics and ratings and uh, put them into the safety regulation you can think of uh, creating safety ratings like NCAP ratings, the five-star rating of NCAP, or setting thresholds and risks. So this is really the usage and pragmatics layers on top of the technology. Is it real? Is it happening? So the answer is yes. These building blocks are forming. So uh, if we look at it, the GRVA, as part of its new assessment and test methods documents, which I mentioned in the first part, is really developing both a scenario catalog, which will map these to uh, specific scenario libraries, and is also developing a different uh, definition of the testing methods. Exactly the standard test, uh, templates, ODDs, test libraries, and procedures that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the scenario libraries will probably be using ASAM Open Scenario 2.0. Uh, UNEC is starting at the functional level, but later on it will expand to ASAM uh, Open Scenario. If we are looking at metrics and rating analysis and the regulatory threshold, again, the UNEC is setting, uh, there is work on setting these thresholds and some of the work in ISO on the safety framework and SAE on safety metric is also intent to recommend uh, on this threshold. And of course, for Telex's coverage analysis is, an, uh, is used as one of the sources of enabling setting uh, these uh, threshold. So yes, these building uh, blocks are forming on top of the base layer uh, technology. And uh, with that, I hope that uh, I gave you the feeling of what is measurable safety, what is the system that is built on top of the technology, and how it will be used by different regulatory and standardization entities. And with that, I would like to switch to the last part of uh, my presentation, which will be a pragmatic examples of how you can verify the ALKS system based on the regulatory spec using coverage driven verification and our approach for measurable safety. Uh, so let's uh, recollection of ALKS. So I mentioned that regulation number 157 was approved. And this is an automated lane keeping system. It's a system that controls both the lateral and longitudinal movement of the vehicle for extended per periods without further driving command. I would like again to point out, today you see in different car lane keeping assist. 
these are the system that will warn you when you are drifting from your lane. It will either vibrate your, your steering wheel or beep like a mobile device or anything like that. But all these systems are do are giving the driver a warning and the driver is controlling the steering. The automated lane keeping system is really controlling the vehicle with no need for driver attention at the time that it is controlling the vehicle. Uh, so this is the first ever level three. A level three automated driving system is a system that's driving the car in full control on a specific uh, limited operational design domain. And the operational design domain for ALKS, it started as a very restrictive one. It is intended to highways where pedestrian and cyclists are prohibited. Uh, there should be physical separation between the traffic directions. And the most strange thing that you can think about is the operational speed. In this initial version, it's limited to 60 kilometers per hour. And you may ask yourself, okay, is this like a useful system if it's limited to 60 kilometers per hour? The answer is yes. Uh, right now, think about two arguments. First, this is the first time a level three system is approved. So the UNEC is taking it slowly. The next revision is planned to take it to 130 kilometers per hour. And the second one is that if you think in many cities around the world, your morning commute is really on a highway where the traffic is jammed and you are really not driving more than 60 kilometers per hour. So this system will help you uh, drive in all these situations and the driver is free to do many other things. This specific regulation has an uh, appendix, appendix number three, uh, which by the way is a contribution, uh, this whole appendix is a contribution from uh, uh, Japan. And it is specifying three critical scenarios for testing and simulation that are caused by uh, the so-called traffic disturbance. What are these critical scenarios? So uh, these are very simple scenarios. One is a car cut in, a car is cutting in in front of you. The Ego is the common name for an, the automated driving systems car. So the, for those of you that may not be familiar with these terms, but this situation is really you are, the car is driving and suddenly a car is, is uh, cutting in in front of you. Uh, the second one is really the opposite of this. You are, you are driving and a leading car is cutting out in front of the Ego and some new information may be exposed. And the third one is a deceleration where the car in front of you is really slowing down. Now, uh, one uh, anecdote that I can point out, if you look at the drawing that are taken from the regulation text, you can see that these are scenarios that were contributed by Japan because you see that the cars are driving on the left-hand side of the road. Okay, so just uh, an, uh, an anecdote. The nice thing about the, this regulation is really that uh, it has a lot of terminology and all the values there are being defined very accurately. And if you look at the text of the regulation, you can identify many different parameters that are involved when you are trying to calculate uh, these scenarios, whether this is the velocity or the speed of the vehicle, uh, whether these are the different distances that you have to play and, uh, and analyze and see what will be the different behavior. And uh, just uh, again, to trigger your attention, uh, since these are complicated system, it may be that you have tested the vehicle at 40 kilometers per hour with a distance of 10 meters. And if you will repeat the same test as at 40.3 kilometers per hour, the test will fail because of some bug or, or, or an issue in the sensors. Now, what uh, we do is once we have these scenarios and the description in the regulation, we translate the scenario to the scenario description language. For Telex's scenario description language, is called MSDL. 
And here we have the, the scenario implementation in a human readable mode uh, or text that articulates in a very formal way what how a cutout scenario looks like. And there is a, there are places where you can see the cars are driving. And the nice thing to see about here, and uh, this is one of the strongest feature of MSDL, I will point out, is this number here. Okay, when you say when you see a number like this, it means that we want to test a, a big range between six and ten seconds. This is really an acceler the initial acceleration uh, phase, and we want to test it on a wide range. And for Telex technology, we'll randomize different instantiations of these range. Other features that uh, can be found here, but I will not dive into, into this, are really parameterization and ability to set different parameters, and also the ability to do a runtime adjustment uh, that uh, is not explicitly stated because it's hidden behind. Uh, let me just give you a feeling what is runtime adjustment. We are looking at this scenario and we are planning for a specific value. However, this car, the Ego car, is an automated system. And based on its software and control, it may decide to behave differently than what was our initial plan for this scenario. For Telex technology has an automated adjustment feature that once we detect the ego car has changed its behavior, we will readjust the other cars such that the scenario will still happen and we will still be able to evaluate the scenario. The next thing we do is really, we are talking about coverage driven verification. So we want to specify what we want to cover. What are the parameters that we are interested in coverage? And what we see here are parameters like TTC, which is time to collision, a common measurement in the industry for a risk, and time headway, which is the distance between your car and the car in front of you. And what we see in the language is really the ability to specify when to sample the value that we want to cover it and how to cover it in what uh, discretization values. Some of these values are really continuous infinite ranges. So what we do is we split the infinite range to specific bucket on a resolution that we care about. And this is how we will measure the coverage. Then you generate many, many instantiation of these scenarios in many varying conditions and many varying different locations. And you run them, you test them, and at the end, you aggregate the results back into your uh, aggregation and analysis tool. And you can start and see what was your coverage, how much did you actually test. Uh, what we see here, and I will just give you a brief because our time is sort of uh, start to run out. In some parameters, we got everything that we wanted. On some parameters, in THW, we will look at it in a minute, we are not there yet. We have some low coverage. And when we look at multi-dimensional spaces, we are at very low coverage. Now, here is THW that uh, we covered. And uh, we see that it has low coverage. Once we dive in, we see that we have an additional problem. It's not just low coverage, it's also a bias. In all the tests that we ran, we see the THW is more than three seconds. These are 3,000 milliseconds, which is three seconds. And in fact, the regulatory spec is asking you to test at two seconds of THW. And what we see here is that none of our tests never hit two seconds. Now, luckily enough, uh, we tested uh, this regulation with Intel's RSS. RSS is Intel's uh, safety algorithm that can control the behavior of an ego. And uh, just to demonstrate what it does, so here on the left-hand side, you can see one of the scenarios where RSS is off 
And what you will see is that due to the speed and the distance, unfortunately, it ended with a collision. And once you turn RSS on, then RSS is keeping the ego out of the unpreventable space and the accidents are being avoided. Why do I mention RSS? Because RSS is a nice feature that you can tune its parameters. And what we found out is that we can tune with the help of Intel and Mobili, we tuned RSS parameters and we were able to switch the behavior of the ego from a biased coverage of THW to what you see here on the right hand side, which is a very good coverage of all the risky area and meeting the regulatory spec, many tests around two seconds in the range about it. So you can really have a good insights and measurements, how you are your ADS performed and how much of the test you were able uh, to cover. So to summarize, we see the building blocks in action, the language, the scenario specification, generation, analysis and coverage of uh, uh, analysis of coverage and analysis of metrics that enables you to improve the safety. We see the formation by different entities around the world of the layer on top, which is the usage and pragmatic layers, scenario libraries, standard templates, ODDs, metrics and rating. So coverage driven verification, measurable safety are forming up and we can see that these metrics can supply you with goals for testing, thresholds, and also relative comparison between automated driving systems and uh, autonomous vehicle. And with that, I believe that uh, my time is up based on the instructions that I got. So I would like to thank you very much for the, for the opportunity to present and to speak to you. Uh, more information is available on Fortelix uh, website. And uh, I believe that right now, uh, this will be the time to switch uh, to Q&A. あ、ジェフ、サンキューベリーマッチ。あ、それではあの、質問回答のお時間とさせていただきたいというふうに思います。えっと、時間の方はまたございますので、えっと、できる限り質問の方をいただいた質問にご回答させていただきたいというふうに
which extend the participation in the UNEC also to countries that are doing self-certification and then the US and Canada and others joined the UNEC. They are uh, taking a slightly revised version uh, of the regulations called the GTR uh, and they are using it and they have some freedom to play with it. So there are two levels of agreements and participation uh, uh, there. But uh, definitely uh, it is affecting the activities of uh, other uh, standard bodies that are trying not to contradict the UNEC and in many cases to deliver to the UNEC needs. Uh, question number three. There are several safety concepts for uh, ADV safety assurance. Would you tell us your outlook uh, for standardization? <laughs> oh, that's the million dollar questions. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the comment that I can make of it, uh, first of all, I cannot predict the future, right? And there are a lot of uh, both political interest and business interest that are influencing this. Uh, I think uh, the one comment I can make is that uh, a regular, the automotive industry has been traditionally driven by regulation. When they're, they are doing their trade-off between how much money to develop, to invest, to what level of quality and others, one of their key considerations is really meeting the regulatory demand. You know, it's a de delicate trade-off, how much to invest, because as I said, you can always test more and strive for more safety. Uh, so I think, uh, I believe that the UNEC will be the one setting the basic threshold. It will affect liability in many countries. And uh, I believe that one of the new factors that will rise up and it start to being uh, formally developed is the so-called positive risk balance, which is the ability to demonstrate that uh, ADSs compared to human driver are giving you some positive balance. And this will be a motivation that they are safe enough uh, to put them uh, on the road. And uh, you see this work uh, started uh, starting to being introduced into different uh, ISO standards. Uh, I believe the standard called uh, 34502 may include some reference to that or introduction to that. It was proposed by Germany just like two, three months ago, and it's in the works. Uh, next question, how did you define edge case? Is the definition of uh, edge case measurable and quantitative? Uh, <laughs> again, a, a delicate question. The definition of edge case uh, that uh, is acceptable in UL 4600 and also in, uh, in uh, one of the SAE document is when uh, one of the operational parameters for a specific system is really uh, toward this edge. Uh, or out, maybe slightly out of his boundaries, but around the boundaries. Uh, then there is a definition of a corner case where some of these parameters are edge cases. A combination of edge cases is defined as a corner case. I think these terms are confusing, uh, but yes, you, with coverage, you can definitely measure uh, how much you tested across all your operational uh, domain. So you can quantify, I don't know what is the right answer, how much to test there, but you can definitely quantify if you tested in the edge, around the edges or not. So coverage measurements will give you also a measurements on how much of the edge uh, did you cover. Why can you say clearly that coverage driven method is, is, is better than mile of quantity? Well, <laughs> I, I I will try to answer it with a negative answer, okay? I think that quantity of miles tells you nothing. I can, and I will use an extreme example uh, for that. Uh, I can uh, take my vehicle to Death Valley in California, which is a desert, no one is there, roads are empty, drive the car back and forth for a million miles. This num, and then I can claim that I, I, dry, I drove million miles. This is a meaningless number. 
it doesn't tell you what you tested, how much you tested, whether it was sufficient, whether you hit any edge cases or any other like that. Coverage driven methodology is really exposing you to the content of what was tested as we have seen in the example of a THW analysis on RSS and ALKS. Uh, does Fortelix have a plan to increase scenario library and test library according to you and NEC? Yeah, okay. So the answer to that is twofold, and I believe this will be my last answer. So first of all, Fortelix is already offering a highway and ADAS library as an initial one, and the, its own library will be uh, expanding. Uh, as of today, uh, we will also be releasing those three scenarios that I mentioned as yet another library. It will be released to the public domain and you can access our website, register and uh, download it. And uh, what we also are going to, to do is uh, I'm personally attending the work groups of the uh, GRVA, VMAD and others. We do plan to offer our scenarios uh, as a contribution, uh, the, the top level definition of the scenario is a contribution to the scenario catalog that the UNECE uh, will develop. So uh, with that, I think that the answer is yes, we will be both helping or contributing to the UNECE and we will also be following the requirements as, the, as the derived from uh, these regulations. And we will also add our own special spice uh, like our own uh, specifics uh, to supply a competitive edge. And with that, uh, I think I have to apologize, but uh, my, my cell phone is telling me that my time is up. So I can uh, return the conversation to the host and let me know what you want me to do.